Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Davis. I'm a curator here at the Whitliff Collections, and it's my honor to welcome you here as we celebrate Writing Beyond Borders with these world-class writers we have this evening. Yeah. You may have noticed that the uh, University Bookstore has books for sale around the corner, and you know I know uh, everybody's got a budget, and books can be somewhat pricey seeming perhaps, but um, you know, it's such a special opportunity to get books signed, which each of our authors will do after the program. And I encourage you to really just kind of think about that and think about this wonderful opportunity you have this evening. And so be sure to take advantage while you're here. And so uh, after our program, the book signing will be right here. So just stick around for that. And I wanna to say too that um, while we here at the Whitliff Collections are the proud hosts of this event, this is uh, actually a collaborative effort involving many people uh, across campus, many of our friends who have stepped forward to contribute their time and funding. And so I'd like to recognize the Center for the Study of the Southwest, the College of Applied Arts, College of Education, Department of Modern Languages, Department of Curriculum and Instruction, and Department of English. You can tell there's a real widespread interest in bringing these writers here this evening. So thank you all who contributed to this. Also, would like to recognize a few, a few key individuals we have here this evening. Among them is Dr. Jaime Chahin, our Dean for the College of Applied Arts, who has done so much over the years to promote the literary arts on this campus. Jaime, thank you again. We also have Dr. Sergio Martinez, our Jones Professor of Southwestern Studies here at Texas State, who worked very hard and made sure to help round up funding and invest a lot of time and effort. Thank you, Sergio. We also have Dr. Frank De La Teja, the director of our Center for the Study of the Southwest, who again was very generous in stepping forward. Thank you, Frank, longtime friend and supporter. And we also have Dr. Jaime Mejia here, a leading expert on Chicano literature, professor of English and somebody who tirelessly uh, circled the airport parking lot uh, after midnight to pick up Tino uh, yesterday, so, or this morning, I should say. Thank you, Jaime, for everything. And I also just want to quickly uh, salute the Whitliff staff. We have an extraordinary collection of wonderful people who work here and work very hard and come together and make great things happen. I just want to recognize in particular our director, Dr. David Coleman, who is here this evening. David, thanks again for your support. And also our, our event coordinator, Lida Guz, who's uh, standing over there, who pulls everything together with all of this input from everyone. Well, I hope you got a chance to enjoy the reception and check out some of the food and drink. I know we want to get started on the program, but I would like to briefly introduce each of our guests here this evening, just to give you a little bit more of an idea of who we have here. Um, start with uh, Sarah Cortez, who we are so pleased to have here. Um, Sarah was born and raised in Houston, and she is today one of the most dynamic and talented writers we have working in Texas. Uh, Sarah had an interesting life's journey on her way to becoming an author. She dreamed of writing while working as a high school teacher, a tax accountant, employee benefits consultant, and then finally she found the work that she truly loved, being a cop. <laughs> Sarah found her voice as a police officer and as a poet, and her poems illuminate the world, that world, in graceful and often humorous ways. And you can tell that by the very title of her first book, How to Undress a Cop, which if you don't have, you need to get. Uh, we have it for sale this evening. Since then, Sarah has been on a roll. Uh, she is the award-winning author of several books, including Cold Blue Steel and her memoir, uh, Walking Home, Growing Up Hispanic in Houston. As an editor, she's put together several amazing, groundbreaking anthologies on Indian noir, uh, the best of Latino mystery. Uh, her most recent book is an anthology she co-edited with Sergio Troncoso called Our Lost Border, Essays on Life Amid the Narco Violence, which just won the Southwest Book Award. And so congratulations on that, Sarah. Sarah has recently been appointed to the Council of the Texas Institute of Letters where she will have an important voice in giving shape to our state's future. And the TIL is very lucky to have Sarah as our we this evening. So thanks again for coming, Sarah. It's great to have you here. <laughs> I 
And we're also very pleased to have with us Mr. Severo Perez. Severo grew up in San Antonio and has made his home in Los Angeles for many years, enjoying not just the climate, but also a very successful career as a filmmaker. Many of you know Severo for his uh, work as the writer and director and really the person who created the film And the Earth Did Not Swallow Him, based on Tomas Rivera's novel. That film is now considered a classic of the Latino uh, cinema. It won top honors at film festivals in the US and around the world. And I'd just like to say as wonderful as that film is and as enduring as that film is, um, it's really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Severo. He's made dozens of films. He's won over 50 awards for his productions. He's also an incredibly talented playwright. He's collaborated with Luis Valdez and El Teatro Campesino. His work's been collected in an, in an anthology of, called Necessary Theater, plays about the Chicano experience. And as a novelist, uh, Severo is the author of The Challenger's Arrow Club, again for sale here this evening. Um, this is a very fine and compulsively readable novel that um, was actually inspired by one of his films. Among the work that Severo has done is this uh, documentary um, on Willa Brown, a pioneering African-American aviator in the 1930s. And Severo really wanted to reach beyond the confines of that 30-minute documentary and tell the rest of the story, which this novel does brilliantly. And I want to mention, too, uh, some of you know this already. Uh, Severo has recently donated his uh, substantial major archive to the Whitliff Collections. His works will be preserved and studied by future generations. And um, for you students out there, you know, if you're really looking to work with primary source original materials and make an original contribution to scholarship, uh, there are a lot of rich resources here in Severo's papers. And who knows why you're doing that? You may even be inspired to make your own film, perhaps. Um, our archives team is, uh, not at this moment, but, but these days, uh, currently busy processing and preserving Severo's materials. And I hope, uh, did you get a chance to see the exhibit that we have uh, in the other room in the lobby? It's just a tiny sliver of, of the wealth of material that's in that archive. So I hope, if you haven't seen it, you get a chance to see it this evening. And so, uh, Severo, who uh, was a student here at one time, just want to say it's so good to have you back in San Marcos, and thank you again for your very generous donation. <laughs> also with this is Dr. Tino Villanueva, who, as many of you know, was born and raised in San Marcos and is among the most inspiring people to ever come from this city. And um, if you were here, here earlier, you may have seen Tino kind of waylaid uh, for a, a presentation uh, from the city of San Marcos with some kind of civic award. And what happened to your, you had this big medal that you were wearing <laughs> a little earlier. <laughs> Quite impressive. And um, Tino's the author of uh, seven books of poetry, including his American Book Award winning scene from the movie Giant, which if you're familiar with that book, uh, has a lot of deep roots here in San Marcos, a movie theater that's still standing downtown. Um, Tino is also a distinguished alumnus of Texas State University. And I should add, Tino also is a donor to the Whitliff Collections. Several years ago, he gave us his working uh, manuscript drafts for this wonderful poem on Cabeza de Vaca, the early Spanish explorer. Um, you may know that we have a rare 1555 edition of Cabeza de Vaca's book here at the Whitliff. It's one of the rarest books in the world. There are probably about 20 copies. And so to have Tino's poem, which is beautifully illustrated and annotated to go with that, Primary text is just a really special treat, so we, we really appreciate that, Tino. Um, and I'll say that Tino has taught uh, creative writing around the country uh, at UT Austin, the College of William and Mary, Bowdoin College. Uh, he currently teaches in Modern uh, Romance, Romance Languages Department um, at Boston University. And his newest book, So Spoke Penelope, this book really speaks to the theme we have this evening of writing beyond borders. This is a book that, as one reviewer noted, is the most extensive and intensive effort to give the longing wife of Odysseus a poetic voice of her own through the 20 years of her waiting during her husband's absence. And so, Tino, I just want to say welcome home and congratulations on your book and thank you so much for joining us this evening.
And finally, our moderator, Dr. Carmen Tafoya, who just completed her two-year term as the first ever Poet Laureate for the city of San Antonio. And Carmen, as you may know, is uh, one of the brightest literary lights the state has ever produced. She grew up in San Antonio, became a groundbreaking figure in Chicano literature. She's the author of more than 20 books, receiving many awards. She's been honored worldwide for her work. She's been translated into many languages, and she appears in over 200 anthologies. Uh, beyond that, she is a role model and a mentor to other writers. She is simply a beloved madrina of Chicana literature. And Karma's newest book, which just came out this week, is This River Here, Poems of San Antonio. And this is the product, I believe, of your term as Poet Laureate of San Antonio, or something like that. Okay, maybe you can talk about that more. And um, so this is also here, and, and again, it just, just a brand new book, just came out. And Carmen, too, uh, is a very good friend of the Whitliff Collections, and uh, we want to share some special news with you. Um, some of you may be familiar with Carmen's great-grandfather, Santiago Tafoya. He was born in New Mexico in 1837, came to Texas as a young man, and had uh, quite an adventurous life and lived to a ripe old age and became a very prominent citizen in San Antonio. And I think, in fact, he brought the name Tafoya to Texas. Uh, we can credit him with that. And um, Santiago was about 71 years old in 1908 and decided to sit down and write a memoir about his life. This is an incredible document. Um, the story was really kind of unknown for almost 100 years, basically. And Carmen and her cousin Laura uh, edited this book for publication. It was published a few years ago. Um, the title, A Life Crossing Borders, is a, really a landmark event in Texas literature and Texas history both. And the good news I have is that Carmen and her cousin Laura have agreed to place this uh, precious manuscript here at the Whitliff Collections, along with uh, family photographs and correspondence and research. And it's just such a privilege to be the place where that material comes. So thank you so much for that, Carmen. And, um, and beyond that, um, here's something kind of even more exciting, really, is that Carmen's own literary papers are coming here, and we're working to make that happen right now. And, you know, when you think about Carmen's work being here with Tinos and Severos and Cavista Vacas and possibly Sarah's one day. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, Sarah. But, I mean, we are here. We have witnesses. And we can talk about that later. Um, and, you know, Cormac McCarthy and Sam Shepard and just... This incredible collection of material that really interprets, it collects and preserves the best artistic representations of this place and this people that we love. And um, just really great uh, to have this wonderful group of writers here this evening. Um, I thank you all for coming and joining us for this event. And let's get on with the program. Thanks again, you all. been given the delicate task of bringing out the best of these incredible authors here and sharing, helping them share their story with you. And when I discussed this with Steve, I said, do we have a, a topic that they're all connected on? I mean, we've got some very diverse things here. How are we bringing this together? And Steve said, how about writing beyond borders? And I think that describes it very well because we have a tremendous diversity of going beyond what is expected, going beyond the traditional, going beyond um, the genres, moving into uh, new fields and, and new themes. And I used to joke a lot. I mean, we've got four Mexican-American authors at this table, and I used to joke that we as a Mexican-American people were, were really good magicians. We were excellent at magic. We could walk right through a Texas history book and poof, just disappear. We could go through a US history textbook and, you know, no evidence of us. We'd cover up our trail. We could go through the world of American movies and TV and society with no proof of our existence. So one of the things that happened, I think, uh, uh, Tino and, and Severo definitely will agree with me from the early Chicano movement, was that there was this 
need to make sure that we documented our existence. A canto y grito, a kind of I am here, excuse me. And so we wrote a lot of declarations, crónicas de mis años peores, and, and, and the work that uh, Severo was doing uh, to take the beautiful uh, early, early novel in Chicano literature, Y no se lo trago a la tierra, and turn it into film and bring it to living, breathing, three-dimensional uh, genre. So we, we had an effort, I think, in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s to say, this is who we are. We're writing about this culture and this point in time. But if we look at what we're producing right now, we see this incredible variety, you know, from mystery and the narco market to black female aviators to the voice of a legendary Greek <coughs> icon, Penelope. And this is, the, this is the range that we're looking at now. We're looking at something brand new and beyond and out there. So I'm going to start with a question. I'm just going to toss this one out to everybody and let, and let you guys pick it up as, as you would like to. Um, I want you to tell, briefly, tell us a little bit about the trajectory of your writing career. In, in what ways do you feel that your work now has gone beyond the borders of documenting your own culture and experiences? And I'll leave that to you. Who wants to start? You know? <laughs> What's curious here is that uh, I did not begin writing about uh, our community, our Mexican-American community, or about myself. <clears throat> uh, when I started writing, uh, let's say, seriously in 1966, 1967, uh, I was writing about the Vietnam War, I was writing about uh, death, I was writing about beauty, uh, poems about love, um, birth and death, and uh, it's not until I come to the, uh, I got my BA here uh, in May of 69, and I got a scholarship to SUNY Buffalo, and uh, for my, I went there for my MA. And it's not uh, until I got to SUNY Buffalo, uh, a very politicized uh, campus then, anti-war and uh, the ROTC building had just been burned when I got there and there were uh, student uh, strikes uh, quite often. Um, you walked into the uh, student center and uh, uh, let's say the door to the dining hall was over there, but you had to walk uh, down this corridor, down this hall uh, that was lined with tables uh, with uh, students manning these, these tables, uh, either uh, uh, giving out pamphlets on the Vietnam War, uh, uh, the farm workers, uh, the uh, land grant movement in New Mexico, uh, birth control uh, information, uh, the, the, uh, j just from all points of the political spectrum, uh, all these individuals giving out all, all these leaflets. And uh, to me, it was uh, quite a, uh, <laughs> like political uh, consciousness, I guess, was born. We all come to consciousness in some way. And uh, that did it for me. I had a friend who was uh, who just retired teaching Spanish out in California, who was uh, originally from Panama. But he had a lot of friends who were Chicanos, who were involved in the Chicano movement in the 60s. So Jose, his name is Jose Cuervo, by the way, just like the tequila. <laughs> Jose Cuervo asked me, haven't you heard of the uh, uh, Mexican-American anthology that uh, has been published in Berkeley, California? I didn't know about it. Anyway. Uh, these are two editors, Octavio Romano and Herminio Rios, two very important sociologists and anthropologists who, who founded this, this uh, um, publishing house for Chicano writing. So I ordered the anthology and that was my uh, wake up period. That's when I found poems by Alurista and uh, Jose Montoya and many other writers that I went back to. And that's when I started writing, reflecting back on my uh, 27 years here in San Marcos, and that's when uh, those poems uh, begin to be born. And uh, 
and then every book has a little, my first two books have a little section on, uh, on uh, poems about, let's just call them uh, poems about the Chicano reality, okay? Uh, I, I heard once that uh, you can be enriched by your uh, ethnicity, actually you can say you can be enriched by your profession, or your gender, your class, your, uh, but you don't have to be limited by it. So I was always looking outside, so uh, you know, the culmination, I guess, is the Penelope, uh, this, this uh, figure from Greek mythology. But I'll stop right there. I have, I have plenty to say about Penelope. Uh, I'm obsessed, still obsessed by this, uh, <laughs> this figure. Severo, I think in terms of chronology, you and I are the same generation coming into the Chicano movement right after Tino. Well, after uh, Tino, almost. we're the same age. Okay. So uh, I'm a little bit older than you. Um, I want to take, uh, say that uh, I grew up in, uh, but before there was television. So I listened to radio dramas. I was, I was obsessed by them. I knew the program schedule of all the radio stations and when my favorite shows would be on. So I was listening to The Lone Ranger and Sky King and Lorenzo Jones and uh, on and on, uh, all the programs that were on. I would just love them. I came home from school and immediately turned them on because I wanted to listen to the radio. So at age 13, I actually started writing radio dramas. Uh, of course, I lived 1,500 miles from anywhere where radio dramas were actually being produced. But uh, that was the beginning of my feeling that I could, I could tell a story and, and, uh, and create a narrative. And uh, of course, also World War II movies were also very important to me. So. Uh, watching films like The Flying Tigers and, uh, and Battleground. Now, Battleground was a really important film for me because it had to do with the company or some of the battles that my father had fought in during the Second World War. So <clears throat> uh, there was a character in that movie that was played by uh, Ricardo Montalban, who was a young kid from East LA who dies. So many years later, when I'm working with my wife and producing a play for the writing a play about Soldier Boy, which is a story of my father coming home in the Second World War, facing that some, <clears throat> he had faced some of the most fierce fighting <clears throat> that existed in the Second World War, that, uh, that I didn't want the character to die, like in Battleground, that the Chicano character actually comes home and has a life <clears throat> and has, makes contributions. So that was essentially why uh, the play Soldier Boy was written. Uh, it's been produced all over the country and I'm very proud of it. Uh, it's in the anthology that uh, Jorge Huerta put together. But uh, I've always felt also that I'm an American. So I'm not limited to just my culture. I love my culture. I love our food. I love our music. I love our history. And it's, not a, it's never been an easy history. <laughs> it's been a very hard history of uh, battles and wars. You know, San Antonio was, uh, people forget that in San Antonio in 1813, uh, the Hidalgo people, the people that were part of the insurrection in Mexico against Spain, uh, 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 actually won a battle in San Antonio and then essentially were killed. There's a street called Dolorosa in San Antonio that where the widows and why the widows of the, of the people who died from the insurrections were kept as prostitutes. The, uh, so all that history, I feel, is, is part of what I wanted to explore. Again, I don't feel limited. I feel like I've been blessed that I have more, that in fact, I have a field that hasn't been done, turned over and over and over many times, that in fact, I get to be one of the first to actually go out there with a plow and tell a story. So there's the sense of blazing the trail and creating um, a certain sense of responsibility too that, that you're creating a perception uh, that will be a very uh, strong in any future analysis. Then in fact, we're not magicians. We were there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Well, like all good questions, it has the uh, the layer on top, and it has many, many deep layers, and I salute you, Carmen, for be leading us off with such a good question. Uh, 
And I'm going to try to be brief because I know you have lots of other good questions for us. Uh, it was, it was my, certainly my luck uh, growing up in the 1950s and 60s to be raised by the two parents that I did have. Uh, they were um, Hispanic, but they were also fifth generation Texans. Uh, our families had been in Texas a long time and I'm very proud to be sixth generation Texan. And my parents raised me. Uh, my mother thought she was going to die before uh, I was age three. So she told me many, many years later uh, that she and my dad sat down and they decided how to raise me starting, you know, like, I don't know, 18 inches long or something, when I was very young, how to raise me to be independent, because she expected that she would be dead and my father would be raising her alone. And so I was raised to be extremely uh, self-reliant and independent, and so it never occurred to me, uh, and I don't, I don't think it occurred to my parents either, that I couldn't do whatever I set my mind to. And that might have something to do with him wearing a badge, gun, boots, and a gun for the last 20 years and enforcing the law, you know, because I just, it never occurred to me I wasn't as good as any man or, or anybody else. Uh, and that, it's never occurred to me in any other part of my life. So in looking at writing, I was certainly afraid of becoming a writer. I was afraid of stepping into taking courses and trying to write because it was my most precious dream, uh, becoming a writer was a dream I've had since about age five or six years old as a child. I didn't begin to step into that dream until age 36. But, um, you know, after the, I would say the second book is the hardest. The first book is not the hardest. The second book is really hard uh, because you don't know if you can do it again or if you can do it better. Uh, but I, um, it, it just never, it, I, I love the comment that Tino made, which is, uh, you know, we're defined, but we're not limited. And uh, again, I was lucky enough to have the parents I did have, and I, I certainly hope many of you have now, or did have, uh, to, to give you the self-confidence, or the beginnings of self-confidence, to make you know in your heart of hearts, no matter how scared you are, you can do anything you want if you put, it, put in enough hard work and effort. Thank you. I'd like to ask you what might be an embarrassing question. What kinds of reactions or resistance have you all received from others when crossing into unexpected territories? And because I don't want to pick on Dino and always make him be the first one to answer, I'm going to start with Severo on this one because Severo, you're a Mexican-American male from the 60s, 70s, 80s through today, writing about and, and making not only a, a film but a novel about a black female aviator from the 1930s. Did, did you get any kind of odd looks from people when you told them what you were working well, on? Sometimes I would, sometimes I get, uh, <clears throat> I got a couple of things like, but they were never negative. Let me just say that. The kinds of, why was a why is a Hispanic brother doing this? Uh, and I would have to tell them that I grew up in a neighborhood that was mixed black and and Chicano or Mexican American because there was no, I mean I can't say really Chicano or even Mexican American because there were Spaniards and people from Central America and things like that in in West Side San Antonio. But my father had a very good friend who lived next door. He was African-American. His name was O.C. Pleasant. He was a really fine, fine human being, a, a wise, humorous man. And uh, <clears throat> I felt like uh, um, he and my father, my father was also, I consider, one of the most brilliant and most uh, uh, fine human beings that I was ever lucky to be around, that these men, uh, it sort of gave me the opportunity to see into their world. My father and, and O.C. would go fishing in, in, at Port Aransas, and uh, it took me once. And in that time, 
I was able to see for the first time, because I had lived in, a, in a, actually almost a closed community, being in West Side San Antonio, you lived in a closed community, that there was these three tiers. There was the white world, there was the Mexican-American world, and there was the black world. And going to, driving to the coast with an African-American man, I realized that there was a completely different world that was not open to them. They couldn't go to the front of a restaurant. Uh, so it gave me an appreciation of, of how remarkable this human being was that was being denied full opportunity into the, United, into the world. Of course, I've learned since that there are many more tiers than three. But uh, in dealing with the characters of the novel, uh, Chauncey Spencer, uh, Willa Brown, uh, Cornelius Coffey, and Johnny Robinson. I modeled them after these fine people that I knew. They were not strangers to me. They were people I knew personally. I knew that there were people that were capable of genius. The genius, is not, the genius does not have a color. So uh, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, uh, for me it was an experience that it, it, I was fortunate enough to meet these people in the last couple of years of their life. And I knew if I didn't tell the story, it would be lost. So it became my mission to finish it, turn it, turn it into a novel. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Well, actually, one of the really surprising um, reactions I've gotten to the fact that I'm a police officer and I also write literary poetry is actually not from other cops, because the cops love the work. Uh, it's actually from sometimes people who think, just because I do a blue-collar job, that I should be stupid, or, d or naturally dumb, you know? And so, uh, but of course, before I went into policing, I mean, I, I will confess, uh, before I, I knew cops and started hanging out with cops and, and ultimately wor working as a cop, uh, I thought cops were stupid too. I mean, I just thought, you know, oh yeah, those are, you know, the, you know, guys that do this and this and this and this, you know, and they scratch here and they do this, you know, and 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 so of course, you know, we live in such a divided society more and more so as we go through our time here in America, uh, where blue collar and white collar workers do tend to get more and more separated. So there's a lot of. Uh, can be a lot of misinformation and believe me now you know uh, I, I was talking with Andres a little bit before and saying you know I've had such wonderful experiences teaching creative writing I know wonderful people who are academics and mentors but if I had to choose between the society of the academic world and the police world I'd absolutely choose a police world because people are nicer <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to be really, really stupid as a cop to piss off somebody else who's carrying a gun, you know? Or in, you know, in the academic world, they do these terrible things because, you know, they figured nothing bad's going to happen. <laughs> Tino, before you answer that question, I want to share with people, you may not know if you have not picked up his book, um, so spoke Penelope, that Tino has been very well received and published in a variety of areas on topics that are really of universal import. And from, I'm gonna read just a little section of one of the poems called At the Holocaust Museum, Washington, D.C. Then there was a Shishki, 1941, a village of 4,000 that could not find the doors to Exodus slaughtered in two days. I touched the photographs of how it was before it ended in a great field of darkness and my body shrieks. Five decades and in another country, I am too late as in a blazing nightmare when, where I reach out, but cannot save you, cannot save you, Sarah, Rachel, Benjamin. In this light, you have risen where the past is construed as present for all that is in me, let the dead go on living. Let these words become human. I am your memory now. 
Did you have reactions? Uh, <laughs> still gives me the willies. Um, that's a tough poem to read. Um, I visited the uh, Holocaust Museum in 1995, um, not because I wanted to write about it. I went because it was important to go. Uh, someone has said that the event of the 20th century was, is the Holocaust. So I went and um, they start you out on the fourth floor and then you work yourself down. And somewhere around the uh, third floor, there are these uh, photographs and uh, they have them uh, attached to the wall. And, and there's sort of like a bridge that uh, connects from one section of the hall to another. And, and uh, uh, the bridge doesn't reach the wall. So what I'm saying is that you can see down that there's some more photographs that continue on the wall down to the second floor. So you have to, as you come down, you eventually hit the second floor. So um, there are a lot of photographs to see, a lot of uh, artifacts uh, to see. Uh, at the end, I bought a um, the catalog, and on the way back on the train mm -hmm. on Amtrak, um, I started looking through the uh, catalog, and uh, this poem that uh, part, part of the poem that she just read uh, is called uh, what's it called? <laughs> At the Holocaust Museum, yeah. Washington D.C. Yeah, there's a third part. Every every part has. Uh, it's called uh, the photographs. <laughs> um, I started writing some notes. Um, it's a three-part poem. I didn't know that this these notes that I was taking down would become you know part three of of a three-part poem. And so subsequently I wrote two, two more, two more uh, poems. There's a freight car, there's a red freight car that was used in Treblinka. And uh, that's, that's, that's rough too. Because you know that you're standing inside, they, they allow you to go into this freight car. That uh, these people were hauled to death. And, uh, Mm. Sometimes I get the question, why did you pick that topic? I don't pick the topic. Sometimes the top topics pick me. And that was one clear case where... Uh, so I, I stay away from these poems because uh, I get emotional. Okay. And uh, I, I tried it once. <laughs> uh, I didn't do too ver uh, very well. But anyway, um, if I could link that to the Panella people, the editor and publisher of the Grolier Poetry Press had read this poem and had read my poem from Shaking Off the Dark to my grandmother, who had nine children. They worked out here in Staples. Um, they were sharecroppers at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, he said uh, that he liked my grandmother poem. Uh, the poem is about, uh, somewhere at the end of the poem it says, uh, uh, it, it brings up the question about a movement, whether her life would have been a little bit easier if uh, the movement could, had shown up in her lifetime, movement with a capital letter. Now, that could be read as a Chicano movement, a uh, civil rights movement, or the women's movement. And uh, so the editor says, I, I, like, I like that part that you identified with your grandmother. And he said he had already read, he had read as well the Holocaust poem. What's a Chicano? from Texas, from the barrio in Texas, uh, writing about Jews when you're not Jewish, and you identified yourself with your grandmother. And he said, this is why I like the manuscript, because uh, you're out of your comfort zone. And you're writing, you're, you're crossing a border. He, he didn't use border, but um, it, it's what I mentioned before, that it, you, know, you, <laughs> you can't be limited by your own circumstances, by your class or your your ethnic, uh, your ethnic background or your profession or your socioeconomic conditions or gender and so forth. Um, so uh, there is a connection between the <laughs> Holocaust point and this. Um, this question comes up, uh, I've, I've read uh, two, three times from the book 
And the, the question does come up, you know, how legitimate is it for a male to be writing about a female and the inner thoughts and the inner drama, the angst and so forth. Well, Penelope is, uh, is um, an Odysseus <clears throat> from Greek mythology. According to Homer, they are, they are mortal. They're human beings like you and me. They have emotions. Um, they're not gods. They're not, she's not a goddess and he's not a god. Uh, they're mortal. And uh, part of the creative process, and here I, I, I'm going to quote uh, uh, Shelley in his defense of poetry, where he says that uh, the writer, the poet, you know, should have the sensitivity to connect up with the other, to, connect, to, to make somebody else's suffering your suffering. He says, a man or a person to be greatly good must imagine intensely and comprehensively. That is, you also have to imagine things with, I didn't live in the 11th century uh, before the birth of Christ. A man to be greatly good must imagine intensely and comprehensively. He must put himself in the place of another and of many others. The pains and pleasures of his species must become his own. So, that's all I've done. You know, they're human beings. They have emotions. They have dreams. They have uh, you know, inner dramas, inner angst, and so forth. So, uh, well, well, here's something I'd like to sort of add to the conversation that um, hasn't come up yet, which is just because somebody says they're Mexican American or Chicano, whatever those those labels mean, they mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I think it's good to remember that that. You know, it's like a beautiful rainbow. I mean, whether you want to say the rainbow is black people, white people, pink people, purple people, and brown people, or you want to say the whole rainbow is brown and there's 50 shades or 120 shades of brown. I mean, one of the subtexts in, in the work I've done, particularly in editing the anthologies, I hope is to remind everyone that um, there's so many different beautiful types, not only of Hispanics, Latinos, whatever word you want to use, but of all human beings. So, for instance, my family, we've been here a long time. Uh, I don't really speak Spanish. I can pretty much understand it. I can work a DOA or traffic accident, you know, in Spanish. I can cook in Spanish. I can make love in Spanish. But, you know, I don't, I'm not really functionally bilingual. Uh, I'm middle class. My family was middle class. Does that mean I'm better or worse than somebody else, Mexican American or Chicano, who is a multimillionaire or or, or, or earns less money than me? No, because we're so many different types of people. Yeah. Well, I used to get a lot of weird stares when I tell people we are not a monolithic culture, and they thought it was a form of religion. You're not a monolithic. <laughs> um, but Mexican American culture is so varied, as is any. And if you do the math, if you get a good statistician, and they're looking at genealogy, for instance, they will do the math on it and find out that we're all relatively within 12 cousins of one another. Uh, if you're living on the same continent, you know, if you're living in the same region, the, the numbers, you know, go down, you're, that's you're called fifth East or Texas. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. That's called East well, Texas. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. There are more than a million direct descendants of the Mayflower living in Africa as Africans, Asia as Asians, and South America as South Americans, because we're a mobile culture and always have been. Even we, are, we I say uh, culture, I'm talking about the human race. We are a mobile people. And so we have these connections that go on. We have these identifications. And you three have found very, very clear connections and shared with us very honestly and sometimes painfully those connections with other, uh, other ethnicities, what appear to be other ethnicities. But we share the emotions. We share the world. And, and I would even be so bold as to say that I think that can be a writer's greatest gift to the reader, which is whether you're writing poetry, where you're trying to find the, the different universals or explain how you relate to the universals, whether poetry or fiction, memoir, traditional essay, or so forth. I think if we as writers can help people connect to the feelings and identities of other peoples, 
whether those people are imaginary, are fictional characters, whether, whether they're our relatives, you know, crazy Aunt Lulu that we put in the poem, you know, about, you know, the cousin who, who marries, you know, five consecutive blonde women. Um, <laughs> and he wants the rest of the family to say he's not been divorced. Um, you know, I mean, we, we, whatever we're writing about, if we can help people connect and if we ourselves can connect, I mean, I have been to literary conferences uh, where I have had somebody in the audience who's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, a panelist say to the audience, don't, any of you that aren't African American, don't you dare write an African American character. Yeah. You know, because you're not going to get it right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking like, okay, you know, maybe we should have told Charles Dickens not to, uh, uh, pretend that he was Oliver Twist, or maybe we should have told, you know, Hemingway not to pretend he was, you know, this or that. I mean, come on, that's 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 not only fiction's greatest gift, but it can be a writer's gift. Mm -hmm. Making connections between the world, and none of you are scared to cross those boundaries, those expectations, to jump outside the box. That's part of the creative life, is to do that, but. I want to ask, what is the funniest or strangest or weirdest experience you've had when trying to break away from traditional expectations? Uh, strange. Uh, I can tell you, um, I can mention something about um, when I was writing the Holocaust poem. Um, I'm not Jewish. Uh, I kept it to myself. I didn't want anyone to know about it. And this went on for about 16 months. Um, toward the end, um, I was sitting down with a Portuguese poet <clears throat> who was teaching in our department. And uh, we were having coffee. And uh, he asked me, what's, what's your latest? What are, what are you working on? You know, writers asked each other this question. Um, what are you working on? And uh, I finally revealed it. And uh, I said, Alberto, his name is Alberto de la Cerda, a major Portuguese poet. Uh, I said, Alberto, I, I've been keeping this under wraps and I haven't told anybody, but uh, uh, it's a Holocaust poem, you know? And, and I explained to him that uh, I might get a reaction from uh, those individuals who are Jewish, and he said, he said to me, great, every poet has a responsibility of writing at least one poem on the Holocaust. So he made me feel a little bit better. <laughs> and uh, later, one of, the, her, uh, one of our professors who was teaching uh, Jewish literature and film actually saw the poem and invited me to class twice to come and discuss it. So, yeah. But I was, uh, you know, I was going to publish it anyway. But I, I wasn't telling anyone that I was dealing with this subject. Um, but I did a lot of reading. It takes a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of books. Uh, not only the catalog, but I, I uh, Primo Levi. I didn't know that the uh, Italian writer Primo Levi had been at Auschwitz. Um, and so when I came to, got back to Boston, I bought a couple of his books and read those. And then I read a little skinny one called uh, The Kingdom of Auschwitz. That was very enlightening. Uh, I read uh, the first 80 pages of Irving Howe's book called uh, The World of Our Fathers and how we, I can't remember the rest of it. He's the Jewish writer who, who goes by, starts his book, um, uh, History of the Jews and how they came to, to the New World, to, uh, to, to the United States. Uh, the first 80 pages are about shtetls. I didn't know anything about shtetls, so I had to read up on shtetls uh, because there's a reference um, and so, um, yeah, so I was a little leery about uh, touching this subject, but Alberto made, made me feel that, that uh, I had the responsibility of writing every poet <laughs> of writing about this nasty uh, historical event. Well, um, first, I, let me say comfort zone. Writing for me has never been a comfort zone. <laughs> it's always been something that's been uh, that I approach every day hoping that something will, something will emerge and at the end of the day I, I, I surprise myself that something did happen. <laughs> uh, but a funny story, or a strange, odd story, is that 
when I was doing And the Earth Did Not Swallow Him as a film, we were doing location scouting. And I was in a van with the uh, producer, the cinematographer, the art director, the production manager, the driver, myself, and another assistant. I can't remember who. There were seven people in the car. And it was 115 degrees out there in the valley of California. And uh, we were driving down the freeway. We were heading for our location. And uh, uh, the car goes from 60 to 50, to 40, <laughs> to 30, and somehow we were able to, the van, uh, finally get, find an exit and get off the road, and the car, and the van dies. 115 degrees. I said, what the hell are we gonna do out here? So I look down the road, and goodness gracious, I see a Ford dealership. So it's about a quarter of a mile away. So uh, in those days, we had information. <laughs> you could call 411. <laughs> and find out that there was a Ford dealership on this road and uh, I called and said, by the way, do you have any rental cars? And he said, no, we don't have any rental cars at the moment, but we just have a van that pulled in. I yeah. <laughs> uh, said, so we, you know, we, we can't wash it or clean it up, but you can have it. Uh, so I said, well, okay. So thank goodness, I walk over there and uh, uh, I, you know, pick up my, my credit cards and things and, and talking to the young woman who's typing. This is a, had a typewriter, <laughs> not a computer. Uh, and um, African-American young woman. And uh, uh, you know, she says, uh, what are you guys doing out here? I mean, well, this is, you know, I said, we were location scouting for a film. And she gets excited and said, well, what is it? And I said, well, it's a film by an author named Tomas Rivera. It's called and The Earth Did Not Swallow Him. And she, uh, she, uh, she keeps typing and says, oh, and, uh, and uh, is it really going to happen? I said, yes, we're, we're location scouting. We're looking for locations in this area. And so she continues typing. And then all of a sudden, a giant tear <laughs> falls on the, on, the, on, the, on the paper. I said, mom, what's going on? I said, what did I, said, what did I do? <laughs> and then I said, you know, is there anything wrong? And she says, no, <clears throat> but I was a student at University of California, Riverside, and uh, Tomas Rivera, uh, I was a, in the married student housing, and he came and he brought a loaf of bread and a bottle of wine on Thanksgiving. And uh, uh, it was, a, you know, it was, a, she was just expressing this, her, her love for this man. And I, so I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in magic. But I do believe that people create things that become magic. And that's what Tomas did. So. Uh, this is a, going to be a bit of a change in story. Uh, there aren't any children in the room, are there? No, I don't want to say that. <laughs> she's, she's caught up in her computer. Okay. Uh, right after my first book came out, How to Undress a Cop, that does include the poem that has the instructions, which do work. Um, <laughs> in case any of you like men or women in uniform. At any rate, uh, that, that book has quite a few poems that have a very uh, obvious erotic flair, shall we say. And, uh, and I was hosted at a, a Texas university who shall go unnamed. And, uh, you know, here I was just, I'd been on the streets, full-time policing for six years. And, you know, that's a very different environment, as I mentioned earlier, from the academic environment. <laughs> and so there was a professor, not my host professor, another professor in the department who was, I, I uh, I probably will not do him justice remembering all his specialties, because now, of course, professors are very specialized. Queer, feminist, deconstructivist, post-French 20th century philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you get the drift. And he was really into his labels. You know, who, who's, who's, uh, you know, who's queer? who's feminist, who's not queer, and so on and so forth. And so he invited me to his class, and he's asking me these questions that have a lot of Freudian terminology in them, which I was a psychology and religion double major at Rice. I have two advanced degrees, so I understood the terminology. 
but as you're aware, a lot of Freudian terminology relates to, you know, certain areas of the body. And so, um, so he asked in front of the class, um, uh, you know, and Miss Cortez or Officer Cortez, you know, when you're working a scene, um, are you a man or a woman? And I'm thinking, hmm, he goes, well, do you have a penis or the other? You know, and here we are with these graduate students, and even at that point in my life, you know, graduate students all look like they're 14, you know, <laughs> or undergrads, you know, and in, what, and in this area of Texas where it's a look, that or that area of Texas, you know, at least you have students who have have had the kind of upbringing where they get embarrassed if you're saying these kind of things in public, as I was. And uh, I just couldn't come up with the P word or the other P word in front of uh, wow. the students. So I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of this? Because I didn't want to insult my host professor, because he was. this was very serious for him, you know, this type of, uh, jargon and so <laughs> I'm thinking how do I get out of this and so I said well you know when when you're work when you're in a scene as a police officer you better be in control of that scene because if you're not you're going to get hurt or killed and he goes ah he turns around to the class you know triumphantly he says and Miss Cortez has a penis <laughs> So how's that for transgressing boundaries? Because, I mean, I, you know, I didn't even realize it, but I acquired something that... <laughs> and actually, when I write fiction, if, uh, if you read my fiction, my, I typically write first-person narrator male. So maybe he was right. I, don't know. <laughs> I think Sarah touches on something that's very important, because it's not always the choice of the writer, whether it's not the writer who is limiting himself often, it's the publisher. Uh, it is the institutional world that decides whether this will be accepted or distributed or, or whether it's okay to do certain things. And I'll use a little example from the opposite end of the scale from children's literature. And that is that about five years ago, um, I had a children's story about separation anxiety. Many, many children today have to be separated from their caretaker. And it might be a parent, it might be a grandparent, it might be a babysitter, it might be an older brother or an aunt or an uncle that is taking care of them. Their parent might be being deployed or they might be going off to work or they might be divorced and this is the only weekend they get with that parent per year. But for whatever reason, it is a major issue. And we had dealt with it in our own family uh, on the adoption of our granddaughter, who came to us at 15 months old with bottles and diapers and, um, and an abandonment issue. And so I had to make a lot of really deep promises when I would fly off to do something and be gone. I'll be gone 24 hours, but I will be back. I will always come back to you. And so I had told this story to her so many times that finally I turned it into a very kind of a funny uh, story. It starts off pretty gently, you know might have to go to the office, and I might have to go to the store, and I might have to go, and it goes, but it, it elevates into the crazy stuff to where, you know, I might have to fight off a passel of bears and scare them with my kung fu, and I might have, so the parent is showing, or the, the adult is showing the child in the craziest terms, but the most sincere terms, always. But I will always, always, always come back to you. Yes, I'll always, always, always come back to you. And each, each verse would end that way. It's a very touching little story and I've read it to audiences and the parents are crying and the kids are laughing and they're feeling so good because they're thinking, boy, they're going to come back to me and the parents are going, that's so good. <laughs> so, you know, it's, a, it's a really nice story and I know it's very attractive to readers of all ages. But when I tried to send it through my agent and she shared it with publishers, they said, well, you know, Carmen's really good at the Latino stuff. She should just stick to the Latino themes. And I thought, oh, Okay, <laughs> you know, uh, and about five years later, just a few months back, my agent calls me and says, you know that thing you have that's, I'll always come back to you, and I said, yeah, and she said, send it to me, I think I found a publisher that doesn't mind that you do Latino things and universal things, and I just signed the contract, so early in 2015, we will have um, a, a universal theme, so it is not always we who restrict ourselves, sometimes it is, 
those who are around us who say, yes, we'll publish that, or no, we won't publish that, or no, we won't have the interest. So it takes those people who truly understand what creativity is about to understand how boundaries must be knocked down, how borders must be crossed if we're to be genuine and authentic. I'm going to open it up to, I think we have time for a couple of questions in the audience. If you have a special question you'd like to ask one of the authors here, um, raise your hand and be loud, or come on up and steal the other mic. Yes. Uh, do you know an Anglo writer, say Anglo writer, who has uh, written well about the Hispanic culture with Hispanic characters? Well, who's taken that role and, yeah. from that point of view? My favorite one is Jim Segal out of New Mexico, who wrote uh, Tu No Mas Honey and the El Santo Queso and a whole bunch of things that were very much set in New Mexico, but in fact, I, I would say John Nichols has also been in New Mexico. Do people think of uh, someone in Texas that has also? The uh, first thing uh, that pops up is the historian, uh, Kerry McWilliams, but he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a creative writer, but he really knew a lot about his uh, Mexican-American history. Uh, it's, a, it's a staple in the Chicano studies uh, classes. Uh, his name is Kerry McWilliams. Uh, what's the north, title? North from Mexico. Uh, north from Mexico, yeah, north from Mexico. Yeah. Um, are, are you talking about fiction or, or fiction or poetry or anything? Fiction. fiction? Mm -hmm. J. Frank Doby kind of crossed into that too, more than other writers of his time period. He was willing to look at the fact that other cultural groups existed, which was not really the trend at the time. And uh, so I think there's a little, there was a little bit of, of openness there, uh, a little bit of uh, crossing over. Professors always like the students. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See the third one. I have three uh, questions. Uh, one for Dina, one for uh, Severo, and one for Sarah. Okay. <laughs> a little indulgent. Um, in Dino's case, I think it's more of a comment, but I think he'll respond to it. Uh, it's, it's a very important initiative that you took there, uh, giving Penelope voice, because in the Odyssey, she's denied a voice. Mm -hmm. Telemachus says, shut up, Mom. I'll take care of this. <laughs> yes. And uh, what is fascinating about this character is that we don't know enough about her. So that's where I pick up the story. She's... Uh, Fascinating to me. Uh, she's called by Homer a wise Penelope. And uh, so we don't, we don't know when she prays to the gods or the goddesses, what does she say? What, what does she ask? How does she interact with her son Telemachus for 20 years? Because when, the, uh, when Odysseus goes off to fight in the Trojan War, uh, Telemachus is a baby, uh, an infant. Um, how does she deal with the maids? How does she feel about 108 suitors who want to marry her at some point? This, is, this happens around the 13th, 14th, 15th year. The, the, the war is over, and by the 12th, 13th, 14th year, uh, around the islands of Greece, it is already known that the, that the war is over, and some of the heroes have already come back to their islands, but where is Odysseus? It takes him 10 more years to return. Uh, we don't know enough about, uh, we know that she's a weaver, she's a worker in wool, so I treat her as an artist. So there are two poems that have to do with weaving, actually uh, uh, two specific poems that have to do with weaving. But here and there she makes references to, to her weaving, to her loom, uh, to her hands, she rubs her hands and uh, uh, seeing how they, they hurt from, from doing this task. So that's where I, that's where I come in, and um, it was. Um, I thought I could write twenty poems, but I, it turned out to be thirty-two poems. Yeah. Thank you. And for um, Severo, Severo, you've been on the other side of the um, street. You've been making films about texts, and now you have a text. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about how somebody's going to make a film about your. Um, that would be nice. Uh, I, I would very much like to see these characters uh, remembered in, 
in cinema because I believe that somehow it makes it larger than life. That these people who are just regular people, but smart people, really smart people, really dedicated people to their purpose, that, uh, well, let me go back a little bit. When I started writing this, I decided that I wanted to fictionalize their story a little bit. I wanted to make it a little bit more romantic, a little bit more exciting than real life, because real life actually is kind of dull, and in fact, real life does not have a dramatic arc. <laughs> so you need to create one. And so I decided with these characters, within the stories of what I knew about them, uh, that uh, there was an arc there. It just wasn't quite in a, re in a, in a dramatic way. So I, I, I chose to fictionalize it. The story is the things that happened, basically most of them are real. Most of them really happened. But the, the, uh, nobody is around anymore to tell me what actually, what the conversations actually were. So I had to invent them and, uh, and come to the conclusions that came from whatever they to what they did. Um, I would have loved, I, lo I would love to see it as a film. Several people have already said seeing it, I saw this as a movie as I was reading it. Uh, and, you think uh, that's because you're a movie maker and you saw it? I have eidetic vision. Uh, I'm eidetic. I mean, I, I see, I think in pictures. I don't think in words. Uh, that's been very difficult <laughs> in my life. I have 20, 30, 20, 200 plus vision. <laughs> I, I, have, I have actually telescope vision. I really see through one eye. The other eye is long for the right. <laughs> but, but it's also uh, an interesting eye because it's the one that uh, is kind of observing from the background and talking to me from the background. Did you really think that, that, that was what was really happening there? <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, if you don't have perfect vision, you don't know what it is. So, as far as I'm concerned, I see perfectly well as anybody in this room. <laughs> but, uh, 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 being a filmmaker, I, I actually wanted to speak about something else, if I could take an opportunity which is the story about making and the earth did not swallow him as a film. Um, is that okay? Is that okay? Um, in 1973, I bought this book in a bookstore in San Francisco. It was called Inose Lo, well, it was, and the earth did not devour him in English. Inose Lo Trova La Tierra. I had a little office on Sunset Boulevard where I was producing educational films and, and like that. And I, I picked up this book, well, it sat on my desk for three months. I picked up this film one day and I, I started reading it and I didn't put it down until I finished it, 88 pages. I, um, I saw in the back of the book that Tomas Rivera was teaching at the University of Texas San Antonio. So I picked up the phone, I called University of Texas San Antonio, got the, got the operator, central operator, who gave me the English department, who then I said, can you, I speak to Tomas Rivera? And a few moments later, he was on the phone. And I told him I wanted to make his book into a film, 1973. Uh, I was at the beginning of my career. I had no idea that this would ever happen. That, that, you know, I didn't know how I was gonna do it, raise the money, but I knew that I had just read something that touched me in my soul. That in fact, he was talking about the people, the culture I grew up with. These were stories about South Texas, about San Antonio, about the migrants. And while my family wasn't migrant workers necessarily, I mean, they were part of that world because my grandfather was a vegetable peddler. And my grandfather, my father, had to walk the streets with two buckets selling tomatoes. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I recognized that I had touched something really close to me. So a few years later, I had produced more stuff. I had produced stuff for HBO, I had produced stuff for CBS, and I felt a little stronger. Okay, I want to make, I'm ready. I'm ready to make this into a film. And I called Tomas, and he would, he, I went and had dinner with him. He was ch Chancellor of UC Riverside, and he said, no, 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 just do it. Just, don't, I don't, you don't have to sign anything. Just do it. 
unfortunately, <laughs> you need an option and a you know, legal document to be able to raise money <laughs> to do a film. So I, I waited and waited, and I went back. I, I petitioned him several times. I mean, I went up there, took him to dinner, I paid for it. <laughs> and he still said, just do it. And then unfortunately, he just dies. And so what am I gonna do? I, um, well, I waited one year and a day, and I called his wife and went and had dinner with her and said, uh, I wanna do this as a film. And she said, well, there's another filmmaker that claims he has the rights. Oh, crap. Okay, uh, she was, and I said, well, does he have a paper? Does he have a document? Does he have an option? And she said, well, he says he does. Well, he never produced that document. He never did. He, he came and he, he, uh, <clears throat> he uh, 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 she said, I'll give him a year. And at the end of the year, if he still hasn't produced a document, I'll sign a document with you. So when that year passed and he hadn't produced the document, I, one day, January the, June the 4th, on June the 5th, I was in on taking her to a restaurant. I had a check for $1,000 and I had a document. She signed it and that's how it began. It took quite a few more years <laughs> to, to finally raise the money. Antonio, I mean, Antonia, yourself, and uh, some other wonderful people served as the NEH panel. They were incredibly supportive all the way through. Um, we, I wrote a script that I'm really proud of, which NEH then supported and funded. And then American Playhouse said, well, we've tried doing films like this before. We really want something that's, that's you know, uh, traditionally chron chronological. Well, this is not traditionally chronological. In fact, what was the wonderful challenge of turning this novel into a film was that the, the, what propels the novel is, in fact, memory and dreams. Uh, and so these are the things that, that, that click the novel and move it forward. Um, so I fought for two years with those bastards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally I won. But I had to make some incredible sacrifices, which I'm sorry I did, because otherwise the novel would have been called, and the earth did not swallow him the lost year. Because in fact, the novel, it takes place in a year. And in that year, of course, there's incredible tragedies, <clears throat> which is what causes, which propels Tomas to tell his story. Well, I had a lot of time. I had a lot of time, so I had a, I had a lot of time to think. And in the process, I decided that I was gonna try, if they were gonna do this to me, I was gonna try some really experimental things with this film. First, I was gonna give this heart film a heartbeat. I was gonna make it alive. I was, so I, I used, when I was started shooting, when I was writing it and I was producing, I produced a document that was like a, a, uh, a musical score. In that musical score, I, I did things like, here the heartbeat of this film is 62, 262 beats a minute. Here it's 70. Here it's 250 beats a minute. When the rancher shoots the boy in the, in the field, uh, his heartbeat just goes through the roof. I mean, so uh, I used a metronome, uh, and I worked with the actors with a metronome, so they understood exactly what I was doing in the process. Uh, they allowed me to do it. They allowed me to impose that on Paul. Um, <clears throat> and so the film then was like this thing that was coming live. It had a heartbeat. And uh, all, the way, all through the process after that, finishing the film, turning it into a, turning it into, you know, going into the editing, I always felt that the film was alive. And it was actually speaking to me, that it was looking over its shoulder and saying, how am I now? Am I okay? What, did you like that? Or should I do it differently? It always kept talking to me all the way through. And there, so uh, I think I go through the, you know, the shooting, the edit, I mean, the cinematographer, the actors, the art directors, all the people in the crew are always con constantly asking you questions. How am I doing? Is this what you want? And again, it goes into the editing, it goes into the scoring. I work with the, with the composer 
at composing, again, things within those rhythms, because the heartbeat is the kind of center of all music. And so the composer immediately understood this and created music that, that fit within that heartbeat. So whether it's the, the, the theme of the film, which is produced several times in, in the film, where it's the little Doña Coquita Polka or the or Cumbia or whatever, they're all done within the same musical frame, using the same notes, either in the major, in their own major or their own minor, and in a couple of exquisite places in both. Um, so, you know, I reach a moment when the film still is talking to me, how am I doing? You know, I'm, I'm getting toward the end, <clears throat> and I, you know, you get to those last moments of when you're, you finish the editing, you finish the sound, you finish the everything you can, and for one time, the film will play for the same way it will be forever. And at that moment, the film didn't look over its shoulder. I, it was like, well, it's like one of my children. Well, it's going to go off, and I hope it'll call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Sarah, um, there's a dirty little secret that does, most everybody likes detective novels, even academics like detective novels. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is that uh, it's stupidity, which is to think that detective novels are all the same and that they're simple and then you just work through the plot and they're formulaic. And, and you've come up with an extraordinary um, take on it, and I wonder if you'd share with us how you thought about it, and how you arrived there, how you take on it. All right, and, and I'm guessing you're talking about not only writing, but the editing. Um, let's see. Well, I've been reading mysteries since I was a preteen. Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, Tom Swift, etc., And I have loved them, and as many of us have read about uh, being a writer, uh, you should build on your passions, build on your strengths. And so it was sort of a natural, that when I was given the idea to edit a, um, my first anthology of mystery. Uh, and the first two anthologies of mystery I edited, and I'm just sort of catching the rest of the audience up here, uh, were for, for Arte Publico Press, who only publishes Hispanic or Latino authors. So we created two different anthologies of Latino authors writing mystery, which are actually the first that have been done worldwide. One is specifically for adults, one is for um, YA, young adult audience. But I, I, wanted, I wanted to bring a freshness and liveness and originality, not just looking at culture and the many different cultures within the Latino world, but also with language and vision and age of writers. I mean, one of my writers is in his 80s, you know, some of the writers are in their 20s. So I wanted just this wonderful broad array of what each one of those people brought in terms of whether they're Puerto Rican, Cuban, uh, you know, whatever, uh, Mexican American. And I'm glad you think it succeeded. I mean, I, the, the reviews have been wonderful. A lot of schools use those books, even in like English composition courses and so forth. But I think um, I was very lucky in that now I've done, uh, edited enough anthologies, my, my seventh one will be out in the fall, that I have a very uh, wonderful set of professional writers that are just uh, exquisite writers. And so I'm lucky enough to get to ask them to work with me over and over again. And, uh, you know, some of these writers, I mean, I, I would just, you know, they should be household names in, in the, the canon because they're so talented, they're so good. And, uh, and many of them already are. You know, Rolanda Hinojosa Smith is in uh, Hit List, The Best of Latino Mystery. So, um, is, is that 
A good answer? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a good question. Yes, ma'am. You know, Tino steps into a long, a long uh, tradition of persona poems, and there's many wonderful, wonderful, wonderful poets who have written, in, uh, if not entire books, individual, incredible persona poems. It's a wonderful tradition. Well, thank you all for being with us this evening. Uh, we will be around, and our books are available out there. If you'd like to have the authors sign your books, this is a wonderful time to get to know them, shake their hands, and tell them which, what their work has meant to you. Thank you very much.